Um, oh no, no, it's not that thing I wanted to use that. Let's see. Um, remember that when we act in our addiction, we are not taking total emotional responsibility. Because the addiction is saying, I want someone else to take responsibility for this emotion within me. Is that, everyone follows that? So, remember on the divine love path, we take total responsibility for everything that's happening in our life. Now that doesn't mean that I'm to blame for everything that's happening in my life, because if we actually attributed blame, what we would have to do is start looking at, oh, all the damage my mum did to me, all the damage my father did to me, all the damage that happened at school, all the damage that happened from the other kids at school, all the damage, you know, and, and all of this stuff that was unexpressed emotionally all through my life is where I am right now. So that's what created where I am right now in a lot of, with a lot of this damage. So rather than focusing on who's to blame, because there are a lot of different places we could point our finger at, and sometimes we feel, even legitimately so, point our fingers at, oh, my mum was to blame for this emotion in me, my dad was to blame for that emotion in me, you know, my schooling was to blame for this emotion in me, and so forth. Rather than doing that, what we need to, do to learn to do is forget about the blame, because while you stay in the blame, you will never release. And what you need to do instead is take total responsibility for the fact that this emotion exists in me right now. And the only person that can release this emotion in me is me. No one else can do it for me. No quick fixes. Mary cannot feel my emotion for me. God cannot feel your emotion for you. God can feel your emotion easy enough, but he can't release it from you without you participating in the process. So in the end, total responsibility means that I need to understand and also feel that I am going to do this emotional work for myself. And when you do it for yourself and you really love doing it for yourself, you'll click into gear with that and then you will start doing it and it will it'll be beautiful for everyone around you too. But unless you start doing it for yourself, you will at some point give up. So it needs to be a personal choice to do it for yourself. And that's on the divine love path. On the natural love path, we often do things for other people and we don't even aware of it, right? And in the Divine Love Path, we want to understand that everything we choose to do has to come from a pure motive within myself. And that's really important to understand. All right, well, our next thing that we're going to do is cover this section about our next focus, which is focus on emotional processing of all of our emotions. And especially my errors regarding love, what love is. And always focus on the fact that they are errors about love. So every single emotional pain that I experience is the result of an error-based belief that I have inside of myself emotionally about love. I don't know what love is. I want to know what love is. I want you to show me. Right? So what we're doing is we're asking God, we're asking God to show us about love. Right? And what, what that means is that we need to start going down this track of connecting with God. So you know how many of us, we can't connect with God when we begin this process. A lot of us don't even know whether God exists, let's face it, right? We haven't really experienced God at the beginning or sometimes we have but for a smidge of our life and, and, and then other times God seems to be a long way away and you know, we don't know whether God is an entity or an energy or just love or whatever and we have all these mixed up concepts and so we, we don't connect to God 
and God is the only person actually that can really show us what love is. So, what we want to do firstly is begin connecting with God. And this counts even within your relationship, especially within your relationship. Yeah. So, so I can't expect Mary to show me what love is. Because Mary might be damaged in love. And Mary can't expect me to show her what love is. Because I might be damaged in love. But if we can both work towards God in connection... God is always automatically, by the creation of all of her laws and all of her principles and all of the different types of laws like the law of attraction, law of cause and effect, law of compensation and all these other laws, God is showing us what love is. The closer I get to God, the more I'll know about love and the more I'll act love in my life. So, when we focus on the emotional processing we're understanding one key point, and that is love is an emotion. See, you can do any other type of development, any metaphysical thing that makes you become a great medium or a great healer or whatever. You can do all sorts of things with regard to intellectual development. You can go to university, get three or four degrees in this particular thing, get a few masters here and a few PhDs there. You can do all sorts of development in your life but until you understand that love is an emotion that I'm going to have to feel then we're not going to really get any closer to God doing all those things um, just on that I had something that happened to me during the break um, it, as I was writing down some yeah. Right. Um, a gentleman gave me a compliment which yeah. was a loving compliment towards myself and um, immediately I froze in fear yeah. um, and I realised that I actually have a fear of receiving love from people Yes. and I also realised that in my relationship I tend to keep my partner at a distance because of that as well um, but the question that I'm asking is my sort of incapability to receive love from people um, that ultimately affects me receiving love from God. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. So you, by allowing love to enter you from people, will begin allowing love to enter you from God. But understand that there is some causal emotion inside of you, and this is what this section is going to start addressing. There's some causal emotion inside of you that causes you to reject love from people and from God. That, and there are emotions about how you feel about yourself. So there's a sort of deep feelings of shame, self shame, self guilt, and so forth about how bad you are inside yeah. of yourself. That and I sort of, yeah, I get very, oh, what's the word, self judgmental on a lot of yes. things, and yeah, yeah, I, I for weeks go into um, sort of like a confused depression about myself and about how people are towards me and all those sorts of That's things. That's it. And every time somebody treats you badly, you think it's something that you did. Yeah, I feel bad and wrong. And yeah. It's almost easier to, yeah, it's easier to accept that than somebody giving me a compliment as well. Exactly. I have exactly the same problem. That's why I know yours so well. <laughs> yeah, my heart just started bumping when you started talking about that. So. Yeah, yeah. Spot on. Hi, AJ. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, I got really confused when I was talking to someone um, the other day about love and for me love is an emotion and he said no it love can be either two things what it can be an emotion or it can be a state and um, I, I felt that this person was coming from a very uh, a natural love uh, place mm -hmm. And um, but it kind of really threw me a little bit too, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh, because that's where I used to. I used to be. That's what I used to believe, mm -hmm. and so it, it did challenge me a bit. Would you be able to just talk a little on that, please? Yeah. So, so what he's basically saying to you is that he can be love without saying, doing, feeling anything. That's what he's saying, isn't he? If he's saying it's a state. <laughs> That's what my interpretation of what he was saying was. And that is a very natural love belief. There's lots of people in the sixth sphere who believe this, that love is a state. 
a state of being, if you like, right? And it's quite often mentioned, like, you know, the Christ consciousness state and all of those kind of things. The truth is, love is an emotion. And therefore, it's not a state. Because what's an emotion? Emotion is an energy in motion. Right? So can you see that if it was just a state, then it would be just the energy. To, to actually be an emo to become effective, love has to be in motion. So therefore it, ha is it becomes an emotion, something that has to be in motion. So every time I believe that love is just a state, I'm avoiding acting upon an emotion. And this is what is a beautiful way of getting out of acting. You see, there are so many people in India, for example, who believe, who are, who are Hindus, who believe love is a state. But they also believe that there's a whole group of people called untouchables. And they also believe that those untouchables can clean their latrine and their toilet for the rest of their life because of something they did wrong in the past. Mm. Now, is this fear, is this state of love actually it real at all? No, not for them because until, unless it's an energy in motion and they start to feel the wrongness of treating people so badly that that's all their whole life is going to be, then they won't feel love for those people. Does that make sense? Love is an emotion. It's going to motivate you always, lots of ways. Yeah, that's clarified it for me. Mm. But it's also made me want to give the other, the state, another name. Not, yeah. Not love. It's not love. So it's what not is even it? real. It's, a, it's an imaginary place. That so it's a delusion. Themselves. It's a it? delusion. Yes, totally. Because how can I on one side say, I love you, and then on the other side say, you can clean my latrine for the rest of your life because of what you did in your past life? Like, would, if I loved you, would I feel like that towards you? No, I wouldn't. You see, love motivates action because of the feeling. So if the feeling isn't present, then you're just fooling yourself in the end. And doesn't it come from this very natural love feeling like when we're all at one with God or Christ consciousness, we'll all just be sitting around feeling all, I don't know, blissy or something, feeling the state. Yep. But for me, when I imagine being at one with God, it's a place full of desire, full of passion, full of like... Full of fun, humour. Yeah, adventure. I want to be doing and feeling. And yeah, I won't have any negative feelings, so my emotions will be love-based. But I'll be in motion and I'll be, um, you know, dreaming and desiring. And it seems like this state that I've heard talked about a lot is a very desireless state. Like there's no... we're all just kind of, yeah, not desiring. <laughs> Zombie, I want to desire. Zombie, zombie, in your head, in your head. You know that song? <laughs> Haven't you heard that song? <laughs> Thanks, AJ. But that, see, that's the problem: is when we get in our head, when we get in our head, we do become like zombies. We start, we start thinking that actually, oh, I know what love is when. Love is an emotion, you see. Everything comes from the heart. And the problem with getting out of the emotion and back into the head is we start philosophizing about all these things that mean nothing in the end. You can philosophize all you like, but if you can't act in love, then you're not loving. It's really, really simple. Like, you can think you are, and you can think you're in this nice end out state, isn't it lovely? But honestly, unless you're acting love in your life, then you're not loving. So we need to face the truth about these emotions. I'm not loving because I'm not loving. I've got some other emotions that I need to work my way through that prevent me from loving. Allow yourself to see them. Don't stay in your head like that. You know, Because in the end what will happen if when you're in the head you will go into this state where you'll hear all these words, oh yeah, they sound good, and then you'll hear all these other words that are almost the opposite to the original words you just heard. Oh yeah, that sounds good too, I don't know what the truth is. And, and you keep going down it. When you're feeling your emotions of love, you will know what the truth is. Really easy, really easy. 
Like, you remember, I've always mentioned to you this discussion about, about killing animals for food, right? Is it right to kill animals for food? And when I first asked that, we first asked that question, lots of us have intellectual justifications, right? We do. We go down this road of intellectually justifying this reason, that reason, and protein for my body, and you know we use all sorts of justifications. But then when I ask the question, would you personally get a knife, right, pull back the head of a little lamb, which you're going to have for dinner tonight, and slit its throat, right? and then gut it, and then eat it. Would you do that? How does that feel to you? Now a lot of us go, whoa, like, you know, that doesn't feel so good now, right? Does it? And, and in fact, when you, when you ask yourself, like, would you do that? You know, in all the audiences I've asked, would you personally do that? Because we're so detuned now from the slaughtering process, there's very few people in the audience who have ever put up their hand and said, I have actually done it. Now, I have actually done it, right? And it didn't feel good, right? When I say it didn't feel good, I was doing it with my father and I vomited, right? It didn't feel good to me. And it won't feel good to you. And yet I never connected that emotionally to about seven years ago. So I did that when I was a child, didn't connect the emotion because everybody else around me was accepting that it was fine. But if I loved and felt and noticed this disharmony that's going on inside of me, I would know. I know the answer to every question just by being love. That's how I know the answer to every question. Can I add something to that? Yeah. Just from my own personal experiences recently that I discussed with you two, I just feel that um, on that subject of vegetarianism, I'm having a lot of trouble giving up eating meat, yep. personally. I'm, and I'm actually going through a fair bit of guilt about it. Guilt about it. And I'm feeling, from what you're saying, uh, in my latest experience, that I have numbed that part of myself. Yes. And for me to go to that place where it's not numb, I need to go to my pets, to my cat, to my dog. Would I do that to them? Or, or even do a number of other things, like get on the internet and have a look at the websites that talk about all the slaughtering of KFC. Get, you know, go on the internet and have a look at the actual process that they go through to give you milk. Like, what actually happens? How many animals die to give you milk, for example? L look, like, inform yourself. You know, desire to be informed yourself about what the process is that actually comes about to give you something. And then ask yourself the question, if I loved, would I like this process? Would I like this process? Well, how does this process feel to me? So you know the truth of everything when you love. And this is the beauty of the truth. And this is why I said in the first century, the, you know, seek first God's love and everything will be given to you. Right? You will know everything once you're in that state of love. So you will know straight away the answer to this question, that question, this question, just by feeling your emotion about it. And if your emotion's in harmony with love, you'll know the answer every single time you'll feel the answer to these questions over and over and over. And nobody will have to tell you the answers because you will be able to feel them for yourself. And this is why it's so important, this bit, is that we have so many errors about love that prevent us from connecting to God. Now remember, this is a talk though about relationship. So in the relationship, I have errors about love which only God can inform me the truth of. My partner can't. I can't inform my partner, she cannot inform me. God can inform us both about the errors that we both have as long as I am emotional about it, as long as I allow myself to process my emotions. That's the only way God speaks to me. 
In our relationship, though, I have often um, considered the way that God loves me through the knowledge I have about God, through her laws um, and the way I receive her love. And I've reflected, if I can't, that's, that's what I know about love. Love enables free will. Love is about truth. Love is all of these things. If I can't tell you the truth or if I'm not enabling your free will, then I immediately know that I have an error about love or an emotion that I need to process. Mm. That's been really powerful for me. Yeah. Yeah. Can everyone see that, like how powerful that is? Yeah, and that's what we want to discuss with you now. On page three, about halfway down, when I'm emotionally processing, I am... All, I always remain in harmony with divine love. So what we want to do is cover this little section. Um, there's other sections that are... Uh, that look, in this presentation, to be frank with you, myself and Mary believe that there is so much good information, but because, because, things, because we're not having the time to discuss it all with you, you will need to look through some of it yourself. And, uh, and I'm happy to answer questions about it at a question and answer session. Unfortunately, because there's so much good information that can help you on the divine love path, we're only going to be able to cover certain parts of it. So what we're doing is selectively picking out parts that we feel are quite important and discussing those. So will we go through the section which mm. is, I always remain in harmony with divine love in my relationship with my partner. So that means I am going to reflect divine love to Mary Mary is going to reflect what, how God would treat me, Mary treats me, and how God would treat Mary, I treat Mary. Does that make sense? I am going to try my best to work through every emotion inside of me that prevents me from treating Mary the way God treats Mary. And Mary, if she's also on the divine love path in the relationship, she will have this feeling, the same kind of feeling, that every single emotion she has within me, she's going to focus on and release so that she can come to treat me the same way God treats me. Now, also, what we want to do is I want to be able to say to Mary every time she's not treating herself the way God would treat her. And I want Mary to be able to say to me every time I'm not treating myself the way God would treat me that she reminds me. Yeah, and I would never expect AJ to treat himself in a way that God would tre wouldn't treat Wouldn't him. treat me, yeah. So I wouldn't then ask Mary to go and do something that God wouldn't ask Mary to go and do. Can you see that? Now that's, when you start thinking about that and just pondering about that a little, wow, that's like, you know, if you, if you let the penny drop on some of the things we've just said to you, you start thinking, whoa, like... That's a pretty big ask, right? But do you know what? The more divine love you receive from God, the more that state will came, come about automatically. If you have to try to do that state, then already you're in disharmony with divine love. Because divine love can only happen from your emotions. It's an automatic thing. So if, if, I, if I know all this stuff about God, like I was saying, I know all about love because of my, rela my developing relationship with God and the knowledge I have of his laws, and then I go, okay, I know that love from God is unconditional and it doesn't, it, God wants me to have my desires and my free will and God gives me her love when I'm in truth. And if then I go and go, okay, AJ, now, from now on, you're going to have your free will and I'm always going to tell you, and I have to really try and intellectually remind myself to do that all the time. I'm back on the natural love path. Immediately. Does that make sense? We're back on the natural love path because we're having to try and we're not releasing the emotional cause as to why we have to try rather than it being an automatic thing. You see, once you receive divine love to the point of at one with God, when you're in... The, you know, the world does not understand Christ consciousness. When you're in the Christ conscious state, what that means is you no longer have to try to be love. You now are going to be love automatically without trying. Now, the only way to get there is to actually release all the reasons inside of yourself emotionally why you can't be love without trying. Does that make sense? So look at why you can't be love without trying. There's an emotional reason going on and this is what we're getting at the emotional processing has to happen there's an emotional reason why I can't be love at any point 
And, and I had a really powerful example of this just in the last week when um, I... So I know all the stuff about anger that we've been talking about. Whenever I project anger at AJ, I'm trying to control him. Whenever I withhold myself from AJ because he's doing something that I don't like, I'm trying to control him. I know all of this and I know God doesn't control her children. So for a long time I've been trying to not get angry or control AJ. Um, and it hasn't worked very well. <laughs> and during the week we were having a discussion about that and AJ was expressing some of his hurt that he felt about that and I was doing the ironing and I went you know what I I want to feel repentant about that but I'm not you know and and I sat down I went to the other room and I sat down and I wrote my journal and had a bit of a pray to God and I just went whoa I'm not there I'm not there yet so for 18 months of trying to be there I, I stopped and literally, I came back in, started doing the ironing, and went straight into a process of repentance for about an hour, sobbing on the floor of just how horrible I felt, like the law of compensation, I guess, of what I had done to AJ in that place. And it was only then that I felt like I was actually dealing with the causal emotion, which was, I want to control so I don't have to feel my feelings. And I just had this overwhelming sense like, God, please take this away from me because I want to feel my emotions and I really don't want to harm this man anymore. So it's a big, big powerful emotions when you hit them. But you, you have to be conscious of the fact that if you're trying, then you're lying. And <laughs> if you're real with yourself about it, it can move really quickly and powerfully. So that's a good Mary quote that you need to remember. If you're trying, you're lying to yourself, right? And to others too. Because if it's not automatic, then, it, then there's something, there's good reason inside of you emotionally that it's happening. Yeah. It's a great quote, darling. Just come out here, didn't it? Yeah. All right, so what are the two things we do? There's two things here that we want to do. One is ask myself, I need to ask myself some questions. I treat my partner the way God treats my partner. So does God punish my partner? Do you ever see God coming out with a big stick and going whack, 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 whack on your partner's backside? Like, does that happen? Do you ever hear God, the sound of God's lovely voice coming down going, ah, to your partner? Do you ever hear that happening? No, God doesn't do those things. So why are we? You see, we're out of harmony with God's love if we do it. Can you see that? So what do we need to do? So we need to stop for a moment and say to ourselves, I'm out of harmony with divine love. There's an emotional reason why inside of me. It's got nothing to do with my partner, no matter what she's done. Right? Or he's done. There's an emotional reason why inside of me. Can you see the importance of that? Does God punish my partner? Does God get angry with my partner? Does God sexually project at my partner? Does God, you know, we could ask a long list of questions, couldn't we? Right. Then the question, uh, then the question always becomes: Well, if I'm doing it, am I out of harmony with my with God? Now, my partner may even want some of those things. So, I, my partner might want me to be angry with them. You know, some of us have so much self shame that we're actually happy when someone's angry with us. Right. Some people feel that way. So that you might have your partner screaming at you, hurt me, hurt me, go on, hurt me. Right? Would God just step in and give her a good slap and say, there you go? <laughs> of course not. God doesn't do any of those things. So why do we? And we need to ask ourselves. And right down to the core emotions, like, like does God project his sadness on the, my partner? Uh, is God morosely depressed around my partner? <laughs> do you know what I mean? We need to ask ourselves about everything we do, really. Uh, 
And is God afraid of my partner yeah. when my partner's angry? No. So if I'm afraid, then there's an emotion in me that I haven't dealt with. Yep. Yeah. God doesn't make my partner do anything, so why would I manipulate my partner into taking out the rubbish? Yeah. There's always emotional reasons. One other quote you can write down from Mary is, always sweat the small stuff. How does, it, how does it work if my desire um, conflicts with Graham's desire? How, how do you... Does the relationship have its own... Entity? Or... Um, let me answer the question. Um, yes, the relationship does has it, has it have its own entity, but if we go back to the original question, and that is, what would God do? So God has her own desires, does she not? Do you think God has her own desires? Yes. Yeah. Well, what's love? Is love not a an emotion, therefore must be following a desire. Where did creation come from? Someone had to come of a desire to create before it came come about. God really wants you to have her love. So that's a desire. So can you see God has desires, right? So, so if God has desires, does she ever project those desires and try to force you into conforming with her desires? No. Okay. So if God doesn't force me into conforming to God's desires, then I've got to ask myself the question, why do I try to get my partner to conform to my desires? So the answer to your question then is quite easy. My partner's allowed to have all of her own desires and I'm allowed to have all of my own desires. But the instant one of my desires wants her to conform, I am now out of harmony with love. What happens to it? Let's 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 record it. What happens to the connect togetherness stuff? Yeah. What? Look, I know I've got an injury injury with togetherness stuff. Yeah. Okay, so I'll own that first. But what happens with in the relationship with the togetherness stuff? The stuff that you do together mm -hmm. in cooperation. Mm -hmm. that, enables the relationship to grow. It's not that that enables the relationship to grow. All right. let's, let's talk about what enables the relationship to grow really, if we're really honest about all this. You are a half of a soul, yes, Jen? Yes. And your soulmate is another half of the soul, right? Yes. So assuming we're in a relationship, this is the same if we're a relationship or not, isn't it? With our soulmate, we're still two halves of a soul, are we not? Okay. So, here, up here somewhere, way up here somewhere, is God's soul. Here, yeah, God. There's two things I need to do going, growing towards God, isn't there? There's one, I need to exercise a desire, yes? Which means automatically that I'll have to start knowing my own passions and desires. Agreed? And then on top of that, I need to release any emotional injuries that prevent me from having a desire for God. Obviously, any that prevent me stop me from growing. Does that not ha happen? Okay. Now, can you see that if I follow my desire, and I'm the male half of the soul, I'm going to get closer to God. And if my soulmate follows her own desire and gets closer to God, she's going to be closer to God. And can you see what that's doing to both of us? We have to come closer to each other. So that's the only way the relationship can grow. That is the only way a soul union can happen. Now, you can have any other type of relationship. Like, you can have a non soul based relationship, but you'll only ever end up in the sixth sphere of the spirit world in terms of your natural love state because, in the end, you're not growing these desires and passions in harmony with God's. And that's what draws you together. That's the power of it. And think about the change in quality of the love between the two halves of the soul as they grow towards God. 
It's beautiful when you think about it because here my love of God is not only so much, here my certain love, and so therefore that's the only amount of love I can reflect to my other half, right? But up here I have a much, much greater capacity to love and I can reflect far greater capacities of love between my partners, between, between the two halves of the soul. Yep, anywhere in the universe. And as long as you've got your desire and dedication towards God, then the relationship is growing. Yes, as you can be in, on earth and your soulmate could take a spaceship and go five light years away, right? And if both of you are growing in your relationship towards God, you will start feeling each other on a moment by moment by moment basis and interacting with each other emotionally on a moment by moment by moment basis and feel closer and you can even have sexual transactions in that state and so you'll feel closer to each other the more closer you get to God. That's the truth of the soulmate relationship. Right? It's a beautiful thing but it only occurs if each learn to exercise their own desires. While you're trying to get Graham to mirror your desires or while Graham's trying to get you to mirror his desires, that's not happening. You're trying to get the other person to conform to your own desire. And so your desire isn't growing, the other person's desire isn't growing towards God, it's growing towards you. So wherever you are is where they'll be. That's not a very good state because you might be, you know, with a lot of emotional baggage. It will feel good temporarily. But Look, I've had a light click on inside of me. Exactly. I, I absolutely understand that that everything that you've been saying, that if you put God first, it, everything becomes simple. I, I just see it so clearly now. Everything becomes simple. Thank you. Yep. Uh, maybe, Dennis? Uh, but can, can everyone else understand what I've just said there? It's a very important truth to get this important truth about desires, that if you follow your pure desires, if you purify all of your desires, what happens is you can't help but grow closer to your partner, whether your partner is your soulmate or not. Right? But at some point in the future, you will also attract your soulmate and you will get closer and closer and closer to them as well. Right? That's what will happen. Because when you're in your desire, you reflect more of God's love the more of God's love you receive into yourself, the more you're reflecting, and so therefore the more loving you become. Yeah, it's a really beautiful system. Hey Jay, as, as you do progress closer, your individual desires become closer as well, don't they? Exactly. If you're soulmates, what will happen is your individual desires will get closer and closer and closer. But if you're not soulmates, you'll notice your individual desires get further apart from each other. And that's one indication of whether you're a soulmate or not. Because in the, it, with being soulmates, the other half of your soul right, will often have very similar attributes and qualities to your half of a soul. So, so Mary, it, like two years ago, you didn't have much of a desire to teach people, did you? In this kind of a setting? No. What did you have as a desire, though? I wanted to work in developing countries with people, um, with refugees. Right, okay. And before I started on the Divine Love Path, I wanted to create um, what I would call, like, love orphanages, like, where, where, you, where you get, like, children who are not being loved in a place where, with some people who have learnt about love, and they show these children how to love. That's what I wanted to create. Not very dissimilar. Right? This was before we even met each other, of course. Right? So we had very similar sort of feelings. And I, I've always had a feeling of I want to change the, the world in love somehow. And Mary's always had that kind of feeling. Now, as we start working through our emotions, firstly, I attract Mary or Mary attracts me through, by working through groups of emotions into each other's life. Then as we work through more emotions, initially Mary feels like getting in front of a group. No, never going to do that. What do you feel now? It's like she's sitting down there and she can't stop herself from coming up here because... Because everyone was avoiding their emotions. <laughs> exactly, because she feels the desire in her and just acts upon it. Does that make sense? And as she acts upon it, it's more in harmony with the, the desire that I feel within myself as well. 
So what we're doing is we're just desiring what we personally desire, not re relying on the other person to go along with it, but the irony is, as we work through our emotions and take emotional responsibility, automatically our desires come into more and more and more and more and more harmony. And it's a beautiful thing. And so now, like, we feel that the more we're progressing, the closer the desires are matching as well. Does that make sense? Mary's always had a desire to travel. Ten years ago, I had zero desire to travel. Five years ago, when I started all of my emotional work, I started to automatically have a desire to travel. Why was that? Because that's a part of our soul. Does that make sense? That automatically I start getting pulled towards, towards Mary's way of feeling on that particular thing that I wasn't feeling before then, and Mary was. But all I was doing was following my desire. I'd never met Mary then. But ironically, by following my desire, I finished up creating in myself a desire that actually mirrors one of Mary's desires. Can you see that? That's, that's the important thing to remember. So, Libby. Go on. Uh, Libby had a question. Oh, Libby had a question, okay. Um, okay. Oh, you've given her a mic, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm all confused now. Go on. Something you said earlier, um, when we move closer to God and um, and process our emotions and then we're more loving and our partner loves us more we move you know we become closer if we're not married to our soulmate and our soulmates moving closer um, <laughs> it's my wedding anniversary today so <laughs> is it a happy anniversary and I was just looking at that camera and thinking I can't buy this DVD <laughs> no worries <laughs> and have it on at home another emotion there <laughs> How does that work? Like surely, um, and I don't know whether my husband's my soulmate or not, I mm. don't know. Yeah. Surely there's all these married couples who are, who are married and living their lives and mm. all of a sudden a soulmate pops up. Yep. What happens then? Now, the first thing I'd like to say is that a lot of immoral things have occurred because a person thinks they've just met their soulmate. So many people have rushed off and into a relationship that's an affair, really, like an affair with a married person or something like that, because they think, oh, this person's my soulmate. Now, if I loved the person the way God loves the person... Which person? Both my partner and my soulmate. Would I do that? Do what? Go off and have Go an affair? Go off and have an affair. What do you think? I would think that you would not. Okay. What would I have to do first? I'd have to sit down with my partner and say, well, I don't know, you, know, you and I aren't working or whatever else it is that you feel and that you feel that you want to... And you'd have to go through it all honestly and with integrity if you were acting in harmony with divine love, right? I don't know. As soon as I ask the question, I feel sick inside. Yeah, and this is your fear about what may have to happen in the future about a potential relationship breakup. The key, I'm not encouraging you to break up with your partner or your, your husband or wife, right? What I'm encouraging you to it's do... It's a husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Like, it could have been a wife and it was just as much okay. I know, I know it's a husband. <laughs> But I'm not encouraging anyone to break up with their husband and wife. What I am doing is encouraging them to treat their husband or wife with love. Now, if I feel within myself that I don't have a desire to be with my husband or wife, am I treating them in love if I don't tell them about that desire? I'm not, am I? I am not being honest. And remember, to, to be loving, I must always be truthful. So if I'm not telling the truth, then I'm not being love in the relationship I'm currently in, let alone any new one. So the first thing to do is if you're in a relationship, understand it's your law of attraction. Right now it's your law of attraction. I need to learn to be love, and when I say be love, act in harmony with the emotion of love in this relationship. And if I can't do that, then I need to address within myself all of the emotional reasons because I'm focused on the divine love path, I address within myself all these emotional reasons why I can't. 
and allow myself to process that. And one of those will be an emotion of love of self. And another one will be an emotion of love of your partner. And then there'll be another emotion that eventually gets developed of love of your soulmate. And if your soulmate's not your partner, you'll find actually, probably, that while you're in harmony with love of self and love of your partner, you'll find that automatically your partner might feel like leaving you or you, you will need to leave them for love of yourself reasons. You won't do it because of some soulmate coming along who whisked you off your feet and you finish up cheating on your partner and leaving your children. Does that make sense? It won't happen like that if you're acting in harmony with love. If you're not acting in harmony with love, that happens like that every day in this planet. You think about it, how many times that happens. Where people rush off into another relationship saying, this is my soulmate, and do a lot of damaging things along the way that are not loving. So it is, it is loving if you have no longer a desire to be with your partner, it is a loving thing to leave them. Because you free them up to have a relationship with someone who does have a desire for them. Even if they're telling you, don't leave, don't leave. Yep. If you don't love them, it's not loving to stay there. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, but it's hard to do. Well, no, because, I mean, for me, I do love my husband. Right. So... So you would stay? Um, yeah. Unless... <laughs> unless... <laughs> unless he was asking you to not love yourself through his actions. He doesn't do that. Okay. Yeah. So you I wouldn't. thought you were going to say unless someone else, um, or unless an understanding. Oh, I don't know. Is this all so complicated? The whole thing of, oh, who knows anything anymore? <laughs> yeah, that's an emotion you feel, Libby. It's an emotion you feel, and you need to feel that emotion. You will know what love will do when you feel and release some of these kind of emotions of confusion and so forth. The key is to allow yourself to feel those emotions. When you feel those emotions, they release from you and then you have clarity. You won't have clarity before you feel the emotion. You have a lot of like, oh, one thing come up, another thing, and the two thoughts are often very opposite to each other even. But when you go through the emotion, that's when you gain full clarity. That's why the mind isn't very clever. Because the mind just responds to all these conflicting emotions all the time. When you release the emotions of conflict, you end up with being able to experience love if you receive divine love through the process. And you'll know what to do in every situation. It'll feel really good. I hope so. It, do it does. <laughs> Trust me, it does. Thank you. It does feel really good. Imagine, imagine that every single situation that comes up in your life, you know what the loving thing to do is. And not only do you know what the loving thing to do is, you actually feel it automatically and do it. So, yeah, you don't even, you get to a place where you don't even have to ask yourself the question of what would God do because you're at one with God and you know what God would do in this situation. Does that make sense? You know automatically what God would do because you're at one with God and you're feeling God's emotions of love pass through you moment by moment. The only time we have to ask ourselves what would God do is when we've got no clear idea of what God's love would do because God's love isn't passing through me moment by moment. So I need to then go down the track of asking myself the question. And the whole point of a lot of these discussions is to get ourselves from this place where we don't know what God's love would do into this place where we actually feel 100% of the time what God's love would do. And once we get there, we don't ever have to ask ourselves the questions again. You see... The most confusing time of your progression on the divine love path is before you get to it one that we've got. Oh, there we go. Oh. Oh. Nobody knew that. They weren't feeling confused at all. You, but, but many of you believe you're still going to be confused afterwards. Agreed? But you won't be because... God's love is now with you 100% of the time. So you will never be confused after that point. Does everyone see that? Like, if you're at one with God, isn't that going to be a relief? 
So at the moment I get totally confused, like totally confused. And all I can do is focus on my emotional processing. That reminds me of something my boys used to do when they were little. <laughs> they're totally confused. They're like <laughs> and that's how we feel a lot of times, isn't it? Just really frustrated. But and AJ, also, you're not at one with God yet. And you, but you love that I rarely, if ever, see you question what would God's love do? You, you constant, you because you've received that amount of divine love. You, you're very much aware, even when everyone else around you is saying that's not loving, mm. and and it is. It, I, I've learned through a you know period of watching and learning that it invariably is the loving thing, and you've learned to trust and know that through your relationship with God. And a lot of times, by the way, I must say. Sometimes I am out of harmony with what I even know from God is the right thing to do. And you will get to this point too, where you actually know inside yourself you're out of harmony and you know what the right thing is to do and you still feel the emotion of disharmony within you pulling you down the wrong thing. Do you know what I mean? And you'll know it in yourself. Right? And that often happens once you flick into complete truth with yourself. So once you make that step of flicking into the complete truth emotionally, then you start realizing, wow, I'm way out of harmony on this issue. Oh. <laughs> like, I've had about 16 of those moments in the last week. To, does that make sense? Many of you have already done this, right? Already had this happen. Oh, we say, oh, oh, you know, and we have this terrible feeling inside of ourselves, right? Oh, you know, oh, you know, how bad am I like now? And that's just a judgment, and I've got to release that. And then we go into the emotion of it and release the emotion, right? And once we release the emotion, we come out with clarity. But you will often get right, the hardest time of this progression is not knowing what God's love would do and falling back into the old patterns of what we do. That's the hardest time. Because you fall back in the old pattern and uh, before you know it you get a bit of a law of attraction based on what, you know, that thing that you just did that wasn't too good. And those kind of things happen over and over. But once we flick into what uh, truth would do and then what God's love would do, and I'm asking that question now all the time, once you get into that, you know what God's love will do after a while. And then once you know what God's love will do, and by the way, you know what God's love will do before you become at one with God. You, you can think of it like a probation period, you know, like P driver. And what happens is, you know, you get, get off your learners, and you get off your learners usually when you learn to live in truth. That's when I feel on the divine love path, you're off your learners. And then you get onto the P plate, the probationary plate. And the probationary plate is this time between this knowing the truth, feeling the truth in you, but you're not doing it. And you get to the point in the end where you know it, almost all the truths of what's going on. Inside, you know all of them, in fact. You get to the point of, it, of what's going inside of you that's disharmonious with love. And you see everyone, you release the emotion, see another, and release the emotion. And you just keep going on. And you get to the point that just before you become at one with God, you are now doing everything in harmony with God's love. Does that make sense? And just at that moment is the time that you have this change into at one with God. And after you become at one with God, you will not be able to do anything harmonious, disharmonious with divine love. And to be frank, if you tried, you would feel so much pain in the process that you wouldn't want to do it either. So in other words, what, right now what's happening for many of us is we feel the pain of trying to be truthful. <laughs> Don't we? Right? The world around you, you know, just, just hammers you when you're truthful, right? And when you get to be in, at one with God, you will not ever again feel, the, feel pain about being truthful. It will always just feel a loving space. Truthful with everyone, yourself, your partner, children, your parents, your environment, the world, the politicians, the religious leaders, the every you will be truthful with everyone. Without fear. Mm. So can you see what's happening with regard to the relationship? I keep trying to pick up this knife. There must be something in that. Just have to watch that. Are you trying to be sinister? Sinister. Not something I've been very good at most no, of No, I life. don't think you are. <laughs> All right. Now, um, oh, the second question is, 
I treat myself the way God treats me. Now, many of this is where it gets a little tricky because many of us believe God punishes us, don't we? From our religious background, some of us feel that. Believe, we believe God punishes us. The truth is that God doesn't punish us, but we believe God does. And so when we look at this, we start going, oh, okay, yeah, I get that. I punish myself all the time. Because, and then we attribute that punishment of self to God. We basically are saying to ourselves that God punishes me. The truth is, of course, we need, when we're saying I treat myself the way God treats me, it's the way God treats me, not the way I think or feel God treats me, which is two different, very different things. Right? So, God does not punish me no matter when I make the biggest mistakes ever. God doesn't punish me. So why would I punish me? God does expect me, through the laws that God's created, to handle the consequences of the mistakes I make. So why do I think I can get away with consequences? Can you see? See, if I think I can get away with things, then I'm really not treating myself the way God treats me because God doesn't let me get away with anything that I do that's disharmonious with love because God's laws are set up that every time I do just something disharmonious with love there's a consequence. Right? So if I let myself off the hook for things that are the consequences of my actions then I'm not harmonious with the way God treats me. Can you see that? So in the relationship in particular now we want to focus on how would that apply in the relationship? So I've got a relationship with my partner, right? And she's yelling at me. Now, how would God treat me? Would God be yelling at me right now? No, I can't hear God yelling at me. God's not yelling at me right now. Only my partner is the only person I can hear yelling at me, right? Can't hear God doing it. Do you think God's capable of yelling at you? God is totally capable of yelling at you. God created your ears, God created your body, God created the whole universe. Don't you think she's capable of yelling at you if she really wanted to? Of course, right? So God's totally capable of yelling at me when I make a mistake, but God's not yelling at me, my partner is. So what's harmonious with love now? Is it harmonious of love for me to stay getting yelled at? Is it harmonious of love of myself? Even if I made the mistake, it's still not harmonious of love of self. Can you see that? Mm. And then, you know how often we yell at ourselves? Stupid, like I've done this so many times. You stupid idiot, why did you do that? Does God say that to you? No. So when you're doing that to yourself, you are out of harmony with God's love. Can you see that? You are out of harmony with the way God's treating you. Where did that other mic go? Oh. Oh, up there. Okay. Thanks, babe. Um, when we were in the cafe up at King Roy, mm -hmm. and we were talking about chemical toilets on the land, and I had um, the process about when we went for the get together trying to cut it short, yeah. um, that I wanted, I had an issue about... A long um, drop dunny. Yeah. yeah. Wanted to provide a loo for the ladies who went to the get-together. Okay, not for the men though. Initially, yes, that's true. Oh, okay. Initially, Initially, not for the men. it was for the ladies. Yep. And then I talked it over with Graham, and then Graham said, "Well, what are the guys? we talk we discovered? Well, what do the guys do?" <laughs> and we went through this long discussion. Yep. 
when we were in the cafe, you turned around and you said to me, and this was a profound revelation for me, that you, you do not provide for, I'm not sure I'm remembering exactly what you said. Mm -hmm. You don't provide for others um, so that they, um, w what they don't provide for themselves. Yes. What? Please say it again because I that will, was... If I loved you, I will not provide for you something you refuse to provide for yourself. So in that example, I had my own chemical toilet and I took it. Mm -hmm. And it just turned out that the law of attraction provided three other chemical toilets at that particular get together. Yeah. Of which that I know of, only one person asked to be using someone else's provision. Yeah. yeah. It all looked after itself. Yeah. Um, and I looked after myself. Yeah. But the revelation for me was that. You, d you don't like if two people want to cook food and neither of them want to cook then they only then they either both go hungry um, yeah hungry or each cooks for themselves yep I didn't know that before I, and I'm allowed to of course cook for my partner if I want right I'm allowed to do, I'm allowed to cook for all of you if I want we can all come around and we can have a AJ get together at one point and I cook for all of you. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but you know, <laughs> it could happen, right? <laughs> and I'm not, you know, Mary thinks I'm a good cook, but... He's an excellent cook. She, she, I don't know whether she, her taste buds are up to scratch or not. <laughs> now you're insulting my taste buds. <laughs> but the, but the th thing is that I am allowed to give a gift to another person. But I would not give that gift if they refused to do it for themselves. Does that make sense? All right, let's say um, there's a lot of problems in the world related to malnutrition, is there not? Okay, M malnutrition, uh, starvation, famine. And, and many of these problems come about because governments are doing all of their violent things which create a whole group of people who now don't have enough funds or money or, or life situation to even grow their own crops. Now, what do I do? Do I go in and give them food or do I go in and show them how to grow their own food? Or do I go in and show them how to grow their own food which the government just comes along and burns down or do I help them leave that country and then grow their own food? Now, love is pretty easy to see what you would do in the end, right? If a person in a country is being harmed, every other country on earth should be willing to take that person and then give that person some land in order for them to grow their own food and be able to be self-sufficient, right? Why not? There's enough on the planet to do this, right? In fact, there's more than enough. In fact, did you know the planet can support, if it was properly looked after could support 60 billion people. Right? Now, most people would argue with that, but that's the truth, that the planet can support that amount of people if it was all done properly, if it was all done based on desire and love, and there was no wars and there was no, all of those things all ceased, and we would still have, we'd still have community land of mountains and ranges and all sorts of other things all available to us as well with, with all of that. But you think how much of Australia is, is arid, not used, because of man, really, in the end. It's not because of the environment out there, it's because of what... Man has the power to do all sorts of things, but we don't do. But anyway, that's another subject. I get off the subject sometimes, hey? So the question is, what would I do for a person in that situation? I would give them the means to leave their country. I would give them the means to actually provide food for themselves. But if they refused, I would not do it for them. It's the same, it's the same thing with God and our emotions. I have to be willing to feel all 
all of my shame, for example, all of my sexual shame, I have to have that willingness within me. When I have that willingness, God can give me the gift of helping to take away that, that emotion from me. But I have to have the willingness. If AJ wants to mow the lawn and I say, no, it's okay, I'll do it, he's had the willingness to mow the lawn and I've given him a gift. If he sat in the lounge and said, woman, mow the lawn, <laughs> which he... Woman, mow the lawn. <laughs> I could do that. But I haven't got a lawn mower though. <laughs> no, or much of a lawn. Yeah. Um, then he would be expecting me to do something that he won't do for himself. Yeah. So, for example, if I'm a woman who's cooking meal after meal after meal after meal after meal for my husband and children, I am out of harmony with love. Why? Because I'm doing something for them that they're not offering to do for themselves and they're not seeming to have any desire to do for themselves. And in fact, you stop cooking for one night and see whether they have an expectation whether you do it and you'll soon see that I've created a monster that has an expectation for me to do that, right? Yeah. But that wouldn't mean that I wouldn't want to desire, I would have a desire to cook for somebody else if I love them. And this is the trouble is a lot of times on earth love then gets used which means that the people who's receiving that love are abusing the love and we need, if we're in a loving space ourselves, we need to address this problem. Can you see? We need to use the mic um, because cause none of it gets recorded, Jen. What if I ask for help? Ask for help from somebody else? Look for why, look at the reason why you don't want to do it for yourself. Now, if it's because you don't know how to do it for yourself, then wouldn't the help you'd be asking for be, can you show me how to do it for myself? Right? And, and ask yourself, why don't you want to do some things for yourself? There's a lot of power in doing things for yourself. And this is one of the things I've learnt overseas with refugee camps and everything, isn't it? That, that is really important to understand that if you can enable a person to care for themselves, it gives them all this worth, self-worth, that they wouldn't have if you just gave them things. Does that make sense? What if I ask for assistance to achieve my desire? You don't need assistance to achieve your desire. There might be other people who join you in your desire, if you have a pure desire, mm -hmm. but you don't need assistance to achieve your desire. Mm -hmm. What will happen, you know, when you understand that, automatically, all of a sudden, you'll get people volunteering because their desires match your desires and all together you achieve something. Does that make sense to you? So that's the same diagrams going towards God. Exactly. Isn't it? It all gets back to that. As I follow my desire, I'm going to attract a group of people around me who are following their desires that just happen, amazing, just happen to match my desires and look what we'll be able to accomplish. So if at this present time I don't really know what my desires are, I only really know a couple, yep. if I keep focusing towards God, then those desires will just emerge from me. Exactly. I understand. And if you don't know what your desires are, then just keep going towards God, releasing the emotions that block desire. When you release the emotions that block desire, you come to know your desires, then learn to act upon them. I want to give you an example. Um, of uh, my interaction with Brian, with Brian at the front here. Is that alright Brian? You don't mind? Okay. Yeah. Over the last uh, year and a half, as you know, Peter's been doing DVDs and they get sort of pro you know, produced and he's followed his desire. Right? Very few other people have done that. Like, he's followed his desire so much that he actually had a camera and he decided to take some pictures of these sessions and all that. He was following his desire that whole time. Does that make sense? So Peter follows that desire and eventually produces these DVDs and everything. And what, and but, but with the desire, you've also got other people involved in the production of those things, obviously, because there's too much for one person to do. So you've followed your desire. But in amongst that, there's some other problems. And the problems are that overseas people get DVDs, you know, and are formatted differently and they've got to reformat them and then they don't have menus and there's all these other problems that come up, right? 
all these other things. And Brian found out that this was a problem through his own desire. Well, I didn't tell him. Some friends of yours told him, so it was your own desire that attracted this. And Brian decided on his own back he's going to do something about that. So what he started doing was looking at how he could actually get the data that's coming out on the DVDs and produce another DVD for overseas, for the different format, which is NTSC. And then I'd, I noticed Brian's desire. I could feel that that desire was in him. I don't think we ever had a discussion about it. Um, and then, so I said, so I went up to Brian, I said, Brian, you've been doing these things for people overseas, haven't you? And he says, yeah. I said, how would you like to actually think about, instead of doing the DVDs in the way they're done, that we could actually give Peter, or give anyone else for that matter, a master? Because I talked about this with Peter some time ago, having a master that he could just copy over and over and over again, that doesn't have to be formatted by anybody. Would you like to be a part of that? And Brian says, yes, that was, a, that was basically our conversation. We talked a little about what kind of uh, format that would be and so forth. Now, you know what happened last week? What happened last week was Brian went out and bought a computer. He bought some software. He did all these things on his own back through his own desire. He spent his own money with his own desire and went ahead and started doing all these things. And today he's given me a disk that I'm going to copy off today and yesterday's session and he'll have it by tonight. Right? And that all happened not... I have a desire for everything, everyone to hear about these things, but it had a, he had a desire to do it himself. Does that make sense? Yeah, go, go on, speak. It turned out that I had the desire to buy the, the equipment that was needed three weeks before you actually rang and asked me to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Now, a lot of people are asking themselves, why doesn't AJ come along and tell me what to do? I offer him help all the time and he doesn't tell me what to do. And do you know what the answer is? Because I haven't yet seen you exercise your desire in a certain direction. Does that make sense? And you see, we're so afraid of desire. We're so afraid of grabbing something, going with it, based on how we feel within ourselves. What we need to do is learn to use desire. Now, God wants you to learn to use desire as well. So although that's a little aside, if you remember that with all your relationships, when you have a desire, every other person who has a similar desire will be attracted to you to help you accomplish your desire. But if you don't have a desire and just have an intellectual thought, none of that can happen and you'll have to make it all happen. So what, what, so what Brian's going to do in that process is make some DVDs, we can give to Peter, it makes whole Peter's process a lot easier and it also makes the people overseas, they, they just get the DVDs, they don't have to recode them and everything. It's just going to make it a lot easier and that's all coming from his desire. Now down the track, what I feel is going to happen, I'm not going to say to Brian at this point, although I have given him some indications of where his desire may take him as a result, but only after he's exercised the desire. So many people come up to me and say, oh, do you know what I'll be doing in the future? Yeah, I've got a pretty good idea. Can you tell me? No. <laughs> Why? Because it's unloving for me to suggest to you something that you have yet to recognise as a desire within yourself. Let yourself follow your desires. The way God treats you is God doesn't come along into your ear and say, ah, oh, hey, Jeanette, do you realise that you've got this desire and that desire? And you say, no, God, I didn't know. I did. oh, no, I didn't know that. Oh, no, I didn't know. He waits for you to recognise what the desire is within yourself. And then, once you exercise your desire, it whammo, all these laws, all these laws of God, and we'll talk about the law of desire at another time, all these laws of God come into play. And it's the same in your relationship. When you exercise a desire for your partner that's pure and she exercises a desire for you that's pure and you both exercise a desire for God that's pure, you will definitely come closer together but also enjoy your desires even more. That's how it will work. Um, uh, sorry. With desires, I notice, and in my own life as well, but I've noticed it with lots of other people too, when you're young, 
you're full of desires and passion and often you, you're going for it, but something in life, something happens to you that shuts down a lot of the desires. Yes. And desire becomes a little bit dead in you and non-existent. Totally. So what happens, you know, what does that to you? You know already. Yeah. What is it? Fear. But what, what created the fear? Um, the experience of? Of being fail, of Fail failing, failure, of failing, yes. of failing. We become so afraid of failure, and and those emo it's emotions of failure from our parents and their parents and their parents in us that cause that law of attraction. So what we need to do is allow ourselves to deal with that law of attraction inside of feel the fear of failure. Once you release the emotions that prevent you from having desire, you will have desire in lots of different areas. Right? You'll have sexual <laughs> desires. You'll have money desires. You'll have people desires. You'll have like in terms of artistic desires, musical desires. You have desires in so many areas you've got no idea that you would have had before when you start letting yourself follow it. And the key is allowing yourself to do it all emotionally because if you don't do it emotionally, you will never discover them, ever. And while a person who can feel your desires in you because of the personality that you have and what's in your soul can come along and tell you. So you can say to your spirit guides, you know, if you're a medium, you can say, oh, you know, what's my desires? Now, like, they can tell you, but it doesn't mean anything really, does it? Until you start feeling them and developing them and working through the emotional injuries that you have about the desires that you feel. Very important. But we're off topic. And I want to get on topic because there's two very important parts that we want to cover. What do you want to talk about? I want to talk about forgiveness. Yep. When we're on the divine love path, we focus on forgiveness. So what does God do? In a relation, in relationship with you, what does God do? God forgives you the moment you do anything that's at disharmony, disharmony with love. It doesn't mean that he takes away the consequences of what you did, but God forgives you for what you did. In other words, God does not have an emotion within herself of wanting to punish you, get angry with you, or whatever for anything you have done wrong. That's what it means. Now, if I'm copying God in my relationship, what does that mean with my relationship with Mary? What would I do? Can you see what I would do? It doesn't matter what Mary does, I will forgive her. The way I forgive her is by working through any emotion that would cause me not to forgive her. Right? And then I can forgive her. So Mary could run off with another man and come back three weeks later. Say, ah, oh, can I come back? Is forgiving her meaning that I'm going to accept her back? No. When she run off with the other man, I dealt with all my emotions about that. It might take three weeks <laughs> to do that. And I'll get to a space where I can love her and not feel any anger, or any resentment, anything for what she may have done. Uh, that's forgiveness. But it doesn't mean that I will have her back because that's a different quality again. What quality is that? That quality is... Mercy. Mercy. It's a quality of mercy. So we need to understand when we would be merciful and when we would be forgiving. You will be forgiving every single time. In the first century, um, some of the disciples come up and ask me a question, how many times should I forgive? Because they heard me talking about forgiveness a lot. Peter, Peter would often, the Apostle Peter, who's called the Apostle Peter now, um, he would come up, and the reason why he'd come up and ask the question is because nobody else was game enough to ask the questions generally. And so what they did was they all got together and decided that Peter, because he's the oldest, he should come and ask the question. So they'd all come up as a group and Peter would ask me the question. And so Peter asked the question, 
how many times should I forgive? And what he did, he didn't just ask the question like that. He just he asked the question in a long-winded way, like some of you have a tendency to do. <laughs> the long-winded question was like, "What about this situation? And what about that situation? What about this? You know how we do it? Like, but what about this? And what about that? But you know how you do that with the issue of truth? You know, many times I say you need to be truthful in every situation. But then someone puts up their hands. But but what about this situation? Didn't I just say every situation? Right? And this is what happened then. So, so he comes up and says, but what about this situation? What about that? He told me all these scenarios. And in the end I said, you would still forgive. And he was really upset about it. Really upset about it. Because he couldn't see why you would forgive somebody who was harming you. Like trying to murder you or trying to kill you. Or, you know, your wife, one of your four wives ran off with somebody else. Or any of those kind of things. He couldn't see any of that, right? And so what he did was he kept on asking the question and he said, should I forgive seven times then? You know, as if like seven's enough. After seven, you, you know, cut off. You know, like, <laughs> like we keep a book, you know. How many times has uh, I had to forgive Peter up to now? Yep, that was the fourth. Yeah, yeah. And then how many times has Libby? Oh, that was the seventh. Can you imagine the book? It would be like, like... Yeah, exactly. If God kept the book, you know how big the book would be? Like, it would be, of course, doesn't, God doesn't keep a book about forgiveness, right? So, you imagine there, I'm keeping a tally of all these things I need to do to, you know, these people up to seven, and then when they hit seven, that's it. That's it. Oh, I'm wiping them out of my life now. And, and honestly, you can't do that because your law of attraction is working perfectly. You've got to draw them back in your life anyway. But anyway, you know, we, we don't think that way generally. And I said, no, no, 77 times 7, Peter. Like, you need to get this. <laughs> that you're going to have to forgive hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times for exactly the same action by one person. Right. And the reason how I learned that was that there was this Bible book, um, a prophet that I read about where, where he had a wife and uh, his wife cheated on him over and over and over again and God told him in the prophecy, so it was a spirit telling him really, but in the prophecy it said that God told him he had to forgive her and take her back each time. And when I read that I realised that that's what God does. God just forgives and forgives and takes us back each time. Doesn't take away the consequences but forgives each time. So we need to learn to forgive each time. If we can't do that, there's an emotion that we need to feel. Does that make sense? Feel the emotion and you will be able to forgive each time. Yeah. You'll get to that point where you'll be able to forgive each time. But you will not take away the consequences of the person's actions that God has already put in place for them through the laws. So there's a difference between punishing your partner and isn't there? Yeah. yeah. So, for example, if I ran off for three weeks mm -hmm. uh, with someone else... Mm -hmm. The lucky you... guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the... <laughs> you would... That would trigger some emotions in you, which you would feel. So you could reach a state of forgiveness. So if I'm not yet in a state of one with God, it would trigger some emotions that I would feel. And then if I came back um, and saw you, if you were in a place of forgiveness, you wouldn't be punishing me. So you wouldn't be go calling me names and uh, blaming, blaming you. whatever. But you might be reflect. You might be saying to me, the consequence of you doing that was that I was very hurt and I felt these things, and I don't feel that there's a state of trust or, or whatever. Yeah, well, the would consequences you? I would feel, I would have dealt with my hurt, wouldn't I? Because obviously I would have released that, right? But I could say, I could say though, and I would also deal with my trust. But I would also know why you did it. Mm. See, when you get to the point of actually dealing with your emotions to that extent. You know why the other person did it. And then you'll know, has this thing inside of Mary, the emotional reason why she chose to do what she did, has it changed? Because if it hasn't changed, then she'll be able to do it again. 
Does that make sense to everyone? Now, the only way it changes is when the person is repentant. And what's the only way I can be repentant? By feeling the causal emotional reason why she did what she did. So it's not feeling guilty and oh, sorry and all I that hurt stuff. him. That was bad. I shouldn't do that. None of that. It was the. It was dealing with the some probably one of the causal emotions that we identified in the addiction section. Mm. Yeah. So it could have been that, like I said something to Mary that exposed an emotion within her that she didn't feel special anymore, and she felt so like hurt by that lack that she didn't want to feel the unspecial if you like emotion I don't know if there's such a word but well, let's make one up and she didn't want to feel that emotion within herself right and so what she did was she ran off to feel special with somebody else now if she came back I would have forgiven by this day I would have worked through all my emotions and forgiven but if I still felt that emotion in her that's unhealed now, if I want her to come back, what's going to happen? If she's unhealed, it's not healed yet, the next time I make her feel not special, she might go again. Can you see that? And the next time, again, and the next time, again. So your love of self would dictate doing something different. Exactly. So if I loved myself, I would not do that. Can you see that? So, God shows mercy when the person is repentant. And this is very important for all you spirits who are here today because God shows mercy to your condition when you are sorry for what was the... when you feel the emotion inside of yourself as to why you did what you did or why you're doing what you're doing. Very important to understand why when God shows it. The rest of the time what God does is allow the law to have its consequence. Does that make sense? So, if Mary still had the emotion in her that I could feel that she's not actually dealt with the repentance of the issue, in other words, she still feels like she needs to be a special woman, and if I don't treat her as special, she's going to go and get someone else who does. That's the emotion, right? And if I feel that that emotion is not out of her, then I would be very unwise, because of my own love of self, to actually accept her back into my life. I may love her, and I may, and I, by this stage, if I'm on the divine love path, I would have forgiven her, but we still will not have a relationship until that emotion is dealt with. And in a way, you're not being very loving to me either, because I'm not being faced to deal with the consequences of what I did. Exactly, and this is why God does not show mercy until repentance occurs. And when I say show mercy, God's love doesn't come in and remove the consequence of something until you deal with the reason why it's being created. God doesn't do that. And this Can is why there are millions and millions and millions and millions of spirits in the first fear who are angry, resentful, you know, all these different emotions they have, and they feel that God should have put them somewhere else. And the reason why God's not put them somewhere else is because of this emotion that they refuse to feel the pain of what they've created and refuse to go to the cause or reason of what they created. That's what repentance is all about. Does that make sense we're around? Now, the big issues that happen in a relationship with repentance are always to do with what I did to the other person. You see, in a relationship, what do we find ourselves doing quite a lot? Oh, you did this to me, and you did that to me, and you did this to me. And you... Don't we find that? Like, we're focused on what the other person's doing to me, and not thinking, wow, wow, like I projected at Mary, this expectation of her to love me. That's unloving, actually, isn't it? Can you feel what that would have felt like for her? to have this big expectation being projected to her that she has to love me. She doesn't have to love me, does she? No? She doesn't have to love me at all. So me having the expectation of her to love me is a projection of mine to Mary. And if I'm really sorry for it, I won't just go up and say, oh, I'm sorry Mary for doing that. You follow me? Because that means nothing. 
I need to look at this issue. What's the causal emotional reason inside of myself that I had the gall to project at her that she should love me? I need to look at that inside of myself and release that from myself. Can you see that? When I do that, I won't have the expectation that she loves me. And of course then, her love for me will be a lot more pure as well, wouldn't it? If she chooses to love me, it will be because she's done it on her own back without being influenced or pressured into doing it. Sorry? It, yeah, you know why it's getting tired? Did you feel that, just a wave of this come over the whole group? Because the spirits, when they heard that, are now looking at... They're looking at their emotions, you see. They start to say, Oh, no. I've got to... What? I've got to actually look at myself and what I'm doing unloving to others. And yes, you have to do that. And feel a deep sense of sorrow about it. And feel the underlying causal emotion. That's the only time it's going to change for you. And God is not going to let you off the hook until you do that. Before then, God is going to keep the law of compensation, God's beautiful laws, just there to help you come to that point of repentance. And as soon as you get to the point of repentance, you no longer need that law, the law of compensation, because the law of divine love is now kicked in and you can receive divine love, have the cause removed, everything can happen very rapidly after that. That's your choice. If you don't do that, that choice won't be yours and you'll stay on the natural love path, receiving the compensation for the, that the law demands. That's what will happen. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Can you see how that applies to a relationship? I need to in my interactions with Mary apply these principles. The more I apply these principles with Mary, the more joy and happiness we are going to experience between each other. The more I focus on doing everything differently and forcing issues and so forth and not dealing with things, taking responsibility, doing the emotions, feeling forgive and feeling repentance, what's going to happen is that our relationship is going to become more strained on the divine love path. Can you see that? So that's things that we need to think about. So how does everyone feel about that? I know our spirit friends are crying a lot at the moment. There's quite a number of them so uh, crying. So they are at least working through. It's interesting for many spirits. The instant you say something, they get that and off they go and deal with their emotions straight away. Here on earth, we hear it, we feel a bit emotional, a little bit of a trickle of a tear, and we go off and try to forget about it as long as we possibly can. <laughs> and unfortunately... So then we get, yeah, well, <laughs> if we get in a car and drive home, often it happens then, right? But, uh, but you see, we're so used to here on the earth just delaying our emotions. And that's the reason why it's a bit slower here than in the spirit world progressing sometimes. Because we delay our emotions here so much. Yeah. Uh, Joy, uh, yeah, Mike. Yeah. In the spirit world, do they make a lot of noise? When they're crying. Crying and yeah, yeah. anger and... Yes, yes. Do they? Yes. And there's a really good uh, book for you to read. Um, I've mentioned it before. It's Postmortem Journal um, by Jane Sherwood. Um, and the reason why it's such a good book to read is in the first seven chapters it outlines the anger that Lawrence of Arabia went through after he passed, right? And what happened with the spirits that were with him when he got angry. When he got angry, they just went and disappeared. Right? And then he had to get into a state of really longing for them to come back and being repentant for why he was getting angry and then they reappeared to help him some more. So, yes, you'll find in the spirit world you get noisy and snotty and, you know, the tear, you have tear ducts in your spirit body, right? And the water is of a, of a different state, molecular state than it is here, of course, but you still have exactly the same responses in the spirit world as you're here. You will cry, yell, scream. 
Millie knows through her own experience with dealing with lots of spirits now that they often have very noisy experiences of releases of emotions. And, uh, and so it's no different there than here. There's just a lot less judgment about it there than here. Yeah. I think that, that um, book is on the website, isn't it? Um, no, because it's, it's not on the website or the C, but, but Peter can send it if you email Peter. The reason why I've done it that way is it's still under copyright, so I can't actually send it to people for free. Uh, okay, forget yeah. I said that. Yeah. So, but um, Peter's happy to do that. So. I just wanted to ask, um, when you reincarnate, do you come back with the same spirit body as well as the same soul? No. Okay. So it's a brand new spirit body, brand new physical body. That's why it gets a bit confusing. Because mm. the spirit body you were used to for 2,000 years isn't the one you see in the mirror anymore. Okay. Um, Dennis, you want to...? Yeah, AJ. Is, is what you've spoken about over the weekend the basis of how we should treat our friends and each other? Apart yeah. from obviously Apart from our stuff. close relationship? Yeah. yeah. Um, yes, of course, the principles of divine love apply in every relationship. What we've tried to do, though, is focus on the relationship with a partner because it's often the relationship with the partner that has the most triggers when you get on the divine love path. Obviously, you start actually you know, doing things with each other that bring up emotions, and you're both dealing with emotions, and it's very important to stay in harmony with love as you deal with those emotions. What I find a lot of people do on the divine love path is they get on the divine love path with their partner, they start dealing with their emotions, and then they feel justified getting angry, blaming their partner and all these other things, and they say, oh, AJ told me to feel my emotions. You know what I mean? And I, that's not what I am saying at all. Because every time you do that, you are harming yourself and your partner. And so, you know, obviously, if you're going to get angry with your partner, you are harming yourself. Your own soul will need to go through things about that, and your partner will have things to harm that's been brought to them because of that. So it's very important to understand these things, particularly in the partnership, because they are the, it's the relationship that we can do the most damage to each other, generally. So I've seen, I've seen soulmates meet within two months or one month be at each other's throats because they do not own their own emotions and, and, know the, and understand these principles properly. And they've split up and never come back to each other for years as a result. Right? And I don't want that to happen to you, but if you choose to not deal with total responsibility, choose to not deal with your emotions and choose to not forgive and choose to not be repentant when you do things wrong, that's what will happen in your relationship at some point if you're on the divine love path. So the key is understanding these emotions are in me and I need to work my way through these emotions and I need to own them in a way that's not harmful. Treat your partner the way God treats you. Now you're not going to be perfect at it because you can't be until you're at one with God. But stop justifying that as a reason for treating your partner with anger and resentment. Lately, like I've seen some posts that Mary has showed me on the net from different people, and they're treating other people unlovingly all the time. Like, I feel, I feel for um, Dean, for example, on the Yahoo forum, because, like, sure, he's not in a loving space perhaps himself at the moment and the way he's being abusive to others, but other people are then getting all abusive to him. Right? Who's in love now? No one. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? No one's in love in that state. If we're in love, we own our own emotions and we don't project anger and resentment and abuse and everything at somebody else. And just because somebody else is doing it to you, it does not give you the right to do it in return. Right? And this especially applies in the relationship. Just because your partner's yelling at you, it does not give you the right to go and yell in return. It doesn't. You break God's law just as much as they do if you do it you're far better off dealing with the underlying emotion. Far better off. And as, like, as Mary will tell you now, it's a lot easier to deal with the underlying emotion because you go long periods of time 
doing the other and, and it's terrible. And as soon as I'm yelling at my partner, I'm actually in a deep state of resistance of one of my own emotions. So the emotion that I've had in the last little while is one of absolute relief, like, oh, finally, I'm not resisting so fiercely that... It was quite a big emotion to go through and it was noisy and snotty and whatever. But afterwards, not only do I feel closer to my partner, but I feel this huge relief, like I'm not holding back the floodgates anymore. Yeah. So this is the beauty of doing things God's way. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is to have a think about, in your relationship, redoing things in such a way that's more harmonious with love with each other in working your way through your emotions. So if you could do that, that would be lovely for yourself. You'll, you'll feel the joy of that and you'll feel a deep pride of yourself when you do that as well, by the way. Um, maybe if I could just have one more question wherever that other mic is. We'll just go over here, yeah, that's it. My name is Mark. My daughter Caroline has a question to you, but I influence her, maybe now. <laughs> What's just happened? What's happened? Who wants to ask the question? She won't, but I have got some problems and I very much influence her very all the time. And maybe I shut her down and this will be... So, so you're trying to influence her? No. Is that what you're saying? Sorry, I didn't follow what you're saying properly. I think what my dad's saying... Yeah? Um, He's, he wants me to help myself. Yeah. Um, we've, we've had a lot of arguments. Yeah. Can I tell you firstly, Dad, that when you want your daughter to help yourself, you're actually out of harmony with divine love. Because as soon as you want somebody else to do anything, you're out of harmony with divine love. All you can do is change what's within yourself. That's all you can do. So focus on what's inside of yourself that would have created anything within your daughter. Does that make sense? I understand that. Yeah. For me it was Can we have the mic across if you're going to? I don't want creating to her some emotional uh, wound by stopping her to be exposed on with the question. And but now want to repair my mistakes. Oh, so before you wanted her to not ask her question, no, is that what happened? No, no. she put hands up before. Yeah. And I influenced her, say, do you have got the question? And that was, that's it. And because she's in the stage of, uh, of uh, whatever it is, I'm sorry, my English is too limiting to explain that, but I want to, she have got the option now if she won't but you see, you see, you're just acting out of your own guilt. You know that you've created damage in your daughter. You've accepted that you have inside of yourself, right? You've accepted that you have. But in getting her to want to ask me something, can you see that what you're actually doing is avoiding the feeling within yourself? I know I have got a lot to work on, yeah. but uh, at least I don't damage her. That was my um, point. But the truth is that every single parent in this audience has damaged their children. Every single parent. But I have got a chance to push a little bit. No, right way. no, you can't push her into repairing it. You can't push her into repairing it. As soon as you push her into repairing it, and this is why she's arguing with you, as soon as you push her into repairing something, you are out of harmony with divine love. And it feels bad to the person who's receiving that. Right? If I can, uh, if I'm a parent and I've created the damage in my son Tristan, so here's my son. Tristan, you want to come over? Because have you met my son before? This is my son, Tristan. Right? So I'm a parent. I've created damage in Tristan, right? He knows that I created this damage in him. I do. Right? <laughs> he feels it every day. Like, he's had all sorts of emotions to work through in his relationship as a result of damage that I've done to him. All right? What I've had to do is I've had to work... Firstly, I've worked through my repentance with Tristan, and I've also had to work through the fact... And to do work through the repentance, I have had to own all of the emotions 
that I created inside of Tristan that were from me. I've had to feel them all, every single one of them. Now, as I've done that, Tristan's found it easier to work through his. But I can't make Tristan work through his. There was a time when uh, Dad gave me t space and, and, a, and a place to work through my emotions. But it, um, at the same time, I felt that I was being pushed to deal with my emotions. So I didn't actually use that time or space to do those things. It wasn't until I actually felt remorse from Dad and also my own remorse and how I was treating my dad in anger back because I, I knew he treated me back. I knew he put damage on me, so I was treating him badly back. And it wasn't until that time until I actually started processing through my own emotions. So, so what I'm saying is that Tristan, imagine if now I tried to force Tristan to deal with his emotions, not, un, not really fully realizing or being repentant or sorry for the fact that I actually created his emotions in him. You see, I've got to go through that first. And when I go through that, then that relieves Tristan into dealing with his emotions. And that's what's happened in our relationship. So, so I can push Tristan into it, but it's so damaging because what, what I'm basically saying is that Tristan's responsible for the way I treated him. And he is not not responsible for the way I treated him. I am. And I need to take full emotional responsibility for that and when I do Tristan will feel that so Tristan has felt when I'm repentant for each causal emotion that he has had to deal with himself and the irony is a day or two after I deal with it he goes ahead and deals with it I usually do too yeah. does that make sense it's, it's usually dad can be in a different country and not talk to him for a week or two and I will be one day behind him in nearly every emotion does that make sense now, the same applies with your partner. If you've got issues to deal with with your partner, if I focus on, please fix your issue, please fix your issue, please fix your issue to my partner, what am I doing? I'm disclaiming all responsibility for my own law of attraction, for my own creation of this particular problem that's happening towards me. When I own it, the irony is that it frees up my partner. Like, I, I had one realisation one, one day, a few, this was a month or two ago, that I was still holding resentment towards Mary for her treatment of me, right? I was down in the eco tent by myself and I just felt a lot of these emotions of remorse for that and actually worked my way through emotions of remorse. And I came up to Mary about five in the morning because I couldn't wait until she woke up. <laughs> and I woke her up, she was up at the house, and I woke her up and said, darling, I realise that I have not freed you into dealing with your emotions. And because I'd worked through the emotion of it, Mary, what did you just feel in that moment? Like, it's this deep sense of relief, relief. wasn't Total it? Relief, yeah. And a few moments, like, hours later, Mary was in some causal emotion she'd been avoiding for months. Does that make sense? So you, this is the same in a relationship as it is with your children or anyone else. If you deal with your own emotion first, then everything will come about in time. Anyway, it's quarter to six, so, uh, oh, just one thing I needed to mention before you leave. Next week, we've got a Gold Coast uh, presentation. There's seating room for 350, is that about right, John? It's about 350. Um, so, so bring along any friends you want. It'll be an introductory session, so people don't need to have watched any DVDs or anything like that. And I'll just hit them between the eyes with the, some basic truths of the universe and we'll see how they cope with it, right? And so that will be our session next week and then the qu day after will be questions and answers for anyone who wants to ask questions about that presentation. Thank you very much for your time today and also for your donations that you've given us yesterday as well. Thank you. Thank you.